Hi everyone, this is Rehole Bitata and today we are going to be discussing how we can change narratives through digital stories. And to start, we have a very special guest today. His name is Roger Okewole. He's a civil engineer, he's a graphic designer, he's an artist, and he's going to share with us his journey, Black representation through stories. So welcome, Roger. Thank you, thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You said that you are a civil engineer, so how come you started, or you end up being a civil engineer and then other things along the way? Well, I, am, I have been an artist for as long as I could move my fingers. Actually reunited with my old nanny who saw on Facebook a man who does graphic arts, whose name was O.K. Wally. And she remembered this three-year-old little boy she used to look after in Scotland who used to draw. And she figured it had to be the same person because in order to keep me quiet back then in my high chair, just give me a paper and a crayon, piece of paper and a crayon, and I'm good. As far as construction, I, uh, my father was a civil engineer, and I'm the eldest of five boys, and I showed an aptitude for the math and, and the... And the, and the and you know how it is in our, in our families. I told dad I wanted to be an artist. He said, no, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be an engineer. I mean... To his credit, he also would buy me art supplies and to stop me from drawing on the walls in the house, he got me these huge re um, reams of paper. Like, they look like giant toilet rolls. Mm -hmm. I mean, huge. And he fitted them in the closet in my bedroom so I could roll the paper out because if I would draw on anything, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the, you, remember the, you remember back then, I don't know what, how it was in Guinea, but um, you'd have calendars. Companies would issue calendars for, for the coming year. So the minute the, when, when a year ended, mm -hmm. I'll take the old calendars and I'll use the blank back side of the paper from for. Uh, for I remember to, to, those days. I yes. remember those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, and, and God bless my, my parents. My mom bought me comic books and, uh, and regular books and things like that. And my dad would get me art supplies as well. So I, I, in, in some ways he was supportive. In some ways it's like, nah, you're going to be an engineer. Okay, and, uh, so you started your career in engineering. Yes, I. Uh, what, what were you doing while doing the career, or even working as an engineer? Um, so I started out my college degree in 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 Nigeria, in the University of Lagos, and finished it at Temple University in Philadelphia. I've done everything from um, heavy construction, roads, bridges. I've done. Um, I've done airports. I worked at Philadelphia Airport. I've done hospitals, Stony Brook University Hospital in Long Island. Right now, I'm senior project manager on a development on Wall Street in New York. Yeah, so I, I've, I've done quite a bit in the, uh, in the engineering field. Into how did you transition from that to graphic design and digital and, you know, all the animation? Let's go back to college in, uh, in Nigeria. I was not exactly the best civil engineering student. Mm. Um, th there are a number of reasons. Some of them were self-inflicted. Um, and back then I never gave up on my interests in graphic arts. So even while I was at the University of Lagos, I was one of the few students, at least in my circle, who worked. I used to work as a freelance artist for advertising agencies in summer and sometimes during the term to make some extra pocket money. But going back to your original question, so I even did animation back then. I did animation trials for TV, TV studios and things like that. So I go into animation back then. When I left and came to the States, I was thinking about continuing as an artist and leaving engineering behind. But circumstances dictated that I stay in the engineering, and I did, and I got my degree. Um, the family went through some changes, so I dropped art for a good 10 years. Mm. And in 1991, someone asked me to do some artwork for an interactive card game that they were working on. Movies started coming up, Thor and Captain America and Hulk and all that. And I'm looking at all these things, especially Thor, and I'm saying, okay, this is all very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very, 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 very uh, entertaining. But I started looking at how it also fed into a particular narrative. So when, and then also at the same time, so you remember Lord of the Rings came out in the early 2000s, then yes. the show Game of Thrones came out. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the nerd who watched every minute of the making of discs of Lord of the Rings. I have watched every single frame of where they show the sketchbooks. I'm that guy. 
Really? Yes, I am that guy. <laughs> I don't buy the one DVD of Lord of the Rings. I buy the book with the five discs and I watch every single one. And they are all rooted in a mythologized version of um, Anglo-Saxon history. It is yeah. because the people that made it very smartly rooted it in things that actually existed. Mm -hmm. So they went to people who knew how to make the ancient armor and they made the armor. And I realized that there is so little of that kind of treatment of my own mm -hmm. um, background, my own ancestry. So you look at Thor, the movie Thor, and this is where the engineering comes in. I look at Asgard, where he lives, and I look at them showing ancient Norse gods work, um, living in halls that are 100 feet high with polished stone floors, okay, marble columns, you know what I mean? Glass and balustrades with terraced landscaping. Mm -hmm. And you start to understand how, and it's not insidious, it's not done out of evil, it's just normal. And that's the worst kind when it's normal. The normal selling of a narrative and how in the mind of someone who does not know anything of their own background, when you contrast that with even the most, even the most um, friendly depiction of an ancient African scene, it suffers by comparison. Somehow counteract that with my own mythologized version of African, uh, African um, deities. So what inspired you? I'll tell you what inspired me. A number of things inspired me. One thing inspired me was Stanley of Marvel Comics. Mm -hmm. Stanley of Marvel Comics had no idea what he was going to build, but he did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's someone who I have known from, I've been following from as a child. So mm -hmm. I know. You look at what is there now, I can assure you, he had no idea. He just did it anyway. What inspired me was my daughter, mm -hmm. who, um, my father was not a traditionalist. He was not into the tribe. He was a Yoruba man, which is from the south, the south uh, east of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But he was born and raised in the north, so he was fluent in both languages. Mm -hmm. He was a civil engineer to the core, so he did not necessarily spend a lot of time imparting cultural values to us. But he could do that because we lived in Nigeria. You're surrounded by it. You will absorb it. Mm -hmm. you, don't need a set, you don't need to build up a sense of self. The concept of a black man as an engineer is not strange. All of the people I grew up around were black lawyers, doctors, engineers. The white people that were there, there were some annoying things about them in general, but in, in essence, they were there working on a par with people who, who were, were there always. Sorry about that. But um, so, that, now I am here. We live in the States. We live in West Orange, New Jersey. I'm raising a Jersey girl. We can say what we want about her being half Nigerian, half Jamaican. We can say what we want about we take her back to Nigeria every once in a while for vacation. The fact of the matter is that she does not have the same surroundings that I do. And I realized that I needed to do something to arm her. I think of this in very militaristic terms. Arm her for the challenges to come. And this is before Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... The thing that I had started this already, but what finally put the nail in the coffin was the Black Panther movie mm -hmm. and the reaction to it. I wanted to say I, that, but I didn't want to assume that. <laughs> no, no, no. You can't assume because I've been reading Black Panther well before anybody ever thought he'd be on, in, the, in the movie. So it's not a strange character to me. But for many people, that movie was their introduction to him. Mm -hmm. And I was a little troubled by... I was very conflicted about it. Because on the one hand, it was very nice to see, for obvious reasons which you don't need to go into. And now we're watching Wakanda, an imaginary country. Mm -hmm. And so much of the stuff is still fantasy. And it was annoying to me. Why? Why was that annoying? It was annoying because I felt that by this point in time, you should have been able to pick up, you should have been able to change Wakanda to Zaire. So, so you or know, Central Africa. So, are you saying that Wakanda should be is more at a subconscious level, and where it could be now at this stage into physical, into yes, real thing? Spider Man is in New York. Captain America is from Queens. You know, Black Widow is from Russia. Tony Stark is from Malibu. 
I never knew that. I never thought about that because I don't know Marvel that way. But I didn't. Now that you mention it that way, it makes sense that yes. the fictional character are placed in real places. But yes. then the Black, yes. Black Panther is fictional and he's yes. fictional. In fact, I'll show you how particular it is. I made a mistake. Uh -huh. Captain America is from Brooklyn. Spider Man is from Queens. You see, there's that. There's that much of a difference. I got it mixed up. Yeah. You, you know. You know what I mean? Um. So I'm saying to myself. If we can have a situation where you have the Game of Thrones that is also, like Lord of the Rings before it, rooted in Anglo-Saxon and Roman and Greek history. Again, even if you're not into it as much as I am, you can watch that show and you can see what the influences are. And then you know, as I do, that Greek mythology, Roman mythology were used as tools to push the idea of the supremacy of Western civilization, along with Christianity. I feel like there should be some kind of pushback. Now, I'm not a politician, so my own area, my, my own area of pushback will never be to go to Nigeria and run for politics and turn things around. Although I would love to be a minister of works over there. People would hate me, but things would get done. <laughs> But my way of thinking was, why don't I start up a graphics line, T-shirts, posters, that gives the Game of Thrones treatment to some of our own figures? I initially thought of sticking to Nigerian um, characters, because at least I have some familiarity there. But I quickly realized that I needed to expand it to other sub-Saharan areas. Why not all of Africa? Why Sub-Saharan? Because the only, African, the only African deities that get any kind of play on the international stage are Egyptian. And they almost always are co-opted to Caucasian figures. Yeah, they are. They are. Because, and the reason why is because it suits the narrative. At the time when Egypt got onto the world stage, it was ruled by a lady called Cleopatra, who was Greek, because they're the colonial masters there. She was descended from Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals, who when Alexander died... Classified as non-white. I'm sorry, second, please? She would be classified as non-white. That's why you see that they're trying to play... She would be classified as non-white, so that it was of mixed heritage background. It's true, but she was more palatable because she didn't look like you or I. No, she wouldn't. <laughs> In fact, not only did she not look like you or I, but credit her, it's my understanding she's one of the few Egyptian monarchs of that time. That, that bothered to learn to, to, to speak Egyptian. Her forebears, her brothers, her forebears, all just spoke their, their ancient their Greek, the Macedonian. So these are the kind of things that I found out as I was doing research. I take a book on mythology. I'm not exaggerating. The book could be this thick. And only a few pages would be on Africa as a whole. Mm -hmm. At some point in time, these mythological stories were collected. They were now sanitized to remove the incest, the, the uh, homosexuality, yeah, the, rape. the rape, yeah. the cannibalism is only hinted at, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the underage sex, you know, things like that. Yeah. And then they were sold in different anthologies as ancient Greek art, especially after the Romans adopted a lot of it. You okay? have a situation where you can show Hercules as a superhero and it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Thor as a superhero makes total sense. But the kids who are descended from where we're from know nothing of Shango or Ogun. Yeah, yeah. Where we don't know what the armor of our ancient warriors look like yeah. unless we look at the bronzes that were borrowed by the British Museum, it kind of pushed me more to keep doing it. Because remember I said my first inspiration was Stan Lee, who I know for a fact. You know how they say an overnight, everybody, you look at an overnight success and it comes after 20 years of, of work? Mm -hmm. Stan Lee was already in his 40s when Marvel Comics really started taking off. I felt like it was worthwhile. And then I remember when I finished Shango, my house, as you'd imagine, is only decorated so in my to, to, to explain to us yes. what Shango is, because we don't know anything about your story. Gotcha. So this is Shango right here. 
Okay. This is the Yoruba god of thunder and lightning. Mm -hmm. He is, as with many myths, based on a real king of the Yoruba, of, of the Yoruba Empire. Mm -hmm. And after his death was deified, which happened to everyone from Caesar Augustus to, um, to uh, Hercules, to, uh, you know, it, it, that's a common thing. Mm -hmm. I depicted him with um, the, 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 the double-headed axe in his headdress is a symbol of Shango. Mm -hmm. Then the masks and the beads are reminiscent of the um, Yoruba and Benin people and what they used to wear. I made him elemental in his body with lightning coming off of him. Mm -hmm. And the, if I don't know whether when I zoom in, if you can see the the um, the globes. Those are divination beads mm -hmm. around his neck. Yeah. That uh, because you know a lot of our um, characters, a lot of our mythological beings were using divinations. Mm -hmm. Then in the upper corner, I have the continent. Mm -hmm. I show the outline of Nigeria, mm -hmm. and I show the name of the ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And what that does is to show that okay. Yes, that is the country, if you look at the map, but there are people within that country because, as you well know, Africa is seen as monolithic. I went to Italy, I went to Spain, I went to France, I went to Africa. One of my favorite things when someone says that to me is, what country in Africa? Yeah. And it's amazing how many people cannot answer that question. No, it's funny because I even hear black people talking about Africa in that way. My daughter who'd been to Nigeria, who was familiar with Nigeria, says to me, what is Yoruba? Now, she knew what it was, but I, 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 it's probably the first time she's actually written out. Mm -hmm. So I explained to her, and that encouraged me even more. Mm -hmm. You know? So all of the pieces that I do are pieces that will say something about the culture. They will say something about the origin, the original um, ethnic group. They will talk to the boundaries of the area, but they also are supposed to prompt questions. So for example, if someone comes to me, I did Yemoja, who is a, 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 a water goddess from West Africa, primarily Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And she also, as with many things with slavery, worship of Yemoja transported to Cuba, areas of Brazil and the West Indies, mm -hmm. and has been conflated with the black Virgin Mary that you'll see every once in a while. So of course, one thing an artist always has to wear there is criticism. And people are like, well, why does she have an Afro? Well, why is she sitting like that? Why is she dressed like an old African woman? And my answer is, how many conversations have you ever had about Yemoja? Mm -hmm. The answer is usually none. So can I ask you, you keep on saying Nigeria, Nigeria, but do you agree to, the, to an extent that Nigeria and many other African countries, in my view, all African countries, in their essence, as you see them geographically on the map, have been actually manufactured and carved out of to suit the interest of Europe. I see not only Nigeria, but many African countries like an imaginary is in the imaginary of someone and that we have embraced that to the point that for people, some people, for some groups, they don't see themselves beyond the boundaries of that, that yes, Yoruba, I did. I Yoruba, Yoruba I, and others is not only confined to Nigeria and that Yoruba expands beyond yes, what we say is Nigeria. So, so how do you um, portray that? Because, you know, right in a stage where people think, oh, this is about Nigerian culture, I don't Nigerian, I don't have anything to do with it. And then some people feel alienated and they will actually try to move their children away from it. You make a great point. And it is one of many really, really genius weapons that colonial governments used. I did a piece called Mother Africa and the Caribbeans that actually I feel in my way captured that. When I'm doing my research, and I'm, well, this I knew before. When I was in school, we were taught that the river Niger that runs down the center of Nigeria was discovered by a Scottish man named Mungo Park. He discovered it. The first question we ask is, did no one else live there? He discovered it. Did no one else live there? Then you, f and, and then, then you get the usual hemming and hawing from the teacher who doesn't know any better. Mm -hmm. Then you find out that Nigeria itself was named by the wife of the governor general of Nigeria in 1910 because she sounded, it sounded nice around the river Niger. He, his name was Lord Lugard, Frederick Lugard. Mm -hmm. And he is, was in charge of Nigeria and became a protectorate of the British, of the British Empire. 
Basically, if you could map it, you owned it. And this is a result of the Congress that was held by King Leopold of Belgium in the late 19th century, basically for the business interests of European countries. So the answer to your question is, absolutely it was formed for the interests of Western, business, um, Western businesses. Now, if you really dig, down it, deep, dig deep down into it, all countries are to an extent artificial. With Africa, it's different in that it was a premeditated business venture. How do you empower young children? I think that the empowering comes from putting, not from grabbing your child and sticking a history book in front of them and saying, read that, especially if you haven't read the history book yourself. Mm -hmm. I think the empowerment comes from putting our culture on a par with what we see around. So the empowerment comes from a situation where the Black Panther is a great movie and the people who made it are to be commended. But let's do something on another Shaka Zulu. Remember they did a Shaka Zulu um, a mini series a while ago. Let's, this is an age where nobody reads. Everybody wants to be on Instagram, Facebook, yeah. TikTok. If you're going to portray something, yes, it's all very well to show yourself. They have these pictures. They'll show people walking with the calabash on their head and wearing the native thing. Oh, yes, I'm going back to my roots. Fine. That's it. If there's one thing Wakanda did was it really transposed that to a more futuristic setting. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. let's, make, let's not apologize or paper over what are perceived as deficiencies. Let's polish them up and let's display them as virtues. I think in my own small part, having a tea show with Mami Water, Mami Water is, a, is like mermaids. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Yes. There's a song. There's a song. Oh, they, 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 it's not the song. No, I don't. I remember the song. There was this albino African man that sang that song. Back in the day, there was this music project. You know, where many artists around the world, they create a song that never ends. And within, yes. and within that, that song, there was this man singing Mami Water. Okay, okay, there you go. Yeah. Mami Water is one figure that is, as far as I know, all up and down the eastern coasts of Africa. Is in the West Indies and is in areas of South America as well. And when, so let's make a t-shirt of her. Let's, um, let's, for every Thor depiction that's out there, and I love the Thor depictions, let's have Shango out there as well. If you're going to talk about Zeus, Zeus, talk about Orumela. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another thing I'm doing is there's a book called um, The History of the Yorubas. And again, I only try and focus on what I know myself and I'm, I'm illustrating it. I don't have a publisher. I don't have anything. I'm doing the illustrations and I'm hoping that one day it'll grab someone's interest to, to, to do it. I did some research. I found out um, of a goddess called Asaseya, who's a Ghanaian um, a fertility goddess and her husband, Nyame, a sky, sky god. And I depicted them as a loving couple. You know, maybe get that on greeting cards and things like that. You know what I mean? Things like that. It's just things to get, get the talk going that there was something before, there was something before 1960 when you got independence, you know? There was something before slavery because even some well-educated folk, it's not, hard, it's not difficult to feel like, some people think that, oh, there was slavery, then we got independence and now we had, no, there was stuff before that. Thing has mm -hmm. been damage done so far, you know, because what you're talking about, you know, I was not brought up with, and many young people, well, people my age, you know, we never saw black people in comics. I don't remember seeing it. Well, I was, I was old. I was like in my 20s. I first came across the Black Panther. Can you believe, you know? So, wow. so what do you think? Is the damage? Yeah. The damage is you see Bruce Wayne, multi-billion dollar, multi-billionaire and a superhero. You'll see Tony Stark, multi-billionaire and a scientist and superhero. You'll see Captain America, war hero, and a superhero, and you won't think that you in some way will be a businessman or a scientist. And God help us, but we have done nothing to make our people proud to defend our nations as war heroes. That's the damage. It's beautiful in simplicity, where if you have enough depictions in pop culture about a certain thing, in some way it becomes true. Mm -hmm. So King Arthur, who is based on an ancient king, who was probably just a tribal chief somewhere, and has been elevated to this great king of a unified England, which is a complete myth. And it was made into a poem 
hundreds of years later, has now become some kind of symbol of English purity. You know, but the funny thing is that the new version that I saw on Amazon includes a black person as Mer as the magician, as Mer as Mer at Merlin. You know, you know, it's that's that's all well and good. I, I I don't mind that, but I'd like a situation where the white person is putting one of our settings. Another thing that Black Panther did very well with Martin Freeman as the CIA agent that was not that was deliberate. Let him be the fish out of water. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I am I'm very conflicted about um, colorblind casting. I'd rather have, okay. yes, you know, where you have Merlin should be white, but you make him black. Okay. okay. I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather have a situation where, you know, it's not, it's, no, make it, make it, make it, make it um, authentic, but change the setting. Say something that I find really interesting. There were black people walking in Europe in, during medieval times. Of course. I find that really interesting that when you look at Game of the Thrones, but by the way, I don't watch Game of the Thrones, but when, I, when you watch all this medieval stuff, you are not there. And, uh, and, but, and I always wondered how come they would say everyone agrees that the first civilization started in Africa, but then they want to confine that civilization to that continent. And like, as you said, monolithic, that doesn't move, doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything. On the whole, we are, are it's, it's, there's, there's an element of it that's self-inflicted, but understandable. Because the whole concept of Western being better is deeply ingrained in our people. Mm -hmm. Deeply ingrained. Even in the movies. It's in the movies, as you said. Even in the movies. In the so, movies. The, yeah. Yeah, so, so West is better. And so there is not that push to say, okay, yes, you had King Arthur. And we had this. We had Orumila. We had Orumila. Yeah. We had, you know, we, we, you know what I mean? And where, where's, these are three of the, uh, the uh, Yoruba kings that were descended from the, 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 first, uh, the, the first person to found the Yoruba Empire. Mm -hmm. I based this, this armor off of the bronzes that are at the British Museum. I just kind of, I'm not an expert in armor. And the idea behind it is just to show that there, are, there were things that were going on before. And the idea is to kind of, expand upon this to the same kind of popular culture treatment that the Knights of the Round Table get. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like it's important until you realize that there's any number of kids who know Sir Lancelot more than they know Olupo. I talked to you earlier about Asasenya, Asasenya and Yame from the Mono people. Okay. Again, I have the ethnic group and the, and the, um, the continent there. She's a fertility goddess. She's a sky god. Is she, is she from the Akan culture? I'm sorry? Is she from the Akan culture? The Not Bono culture. I believe the, the Akan and the Bono are, 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 are mixed. I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not certain. But mm -hmm. she, and this is her symbol right here on the crown. This is her symbol. Mm -hmm. And if you have Tristan and Isolde and you have Romeo and Juliet, where's this love story? Mm. You know what I mean? Where is this, where is this story? Why do I know more about um, Tristan and Isolde than I know about Asase and Yami? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And what would you um, say to those that they might argue you're just trying to replicate to do a black version of Romeo and Juliet? You're trying to do a black version of Raymond Rim and Rimula. What would you say to those people? Because I know most people say, oh, that's the same thing, but, but black. I would say that when you consider that William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet based on stories he himself read, that Tristan and Isold are based on multiple lyrical stories and oral stories that were told from time before, that there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I would also say that when you, take it, when you decide to do a, take a, have a fresh take on a story, like this is Ogun, the um, Yoruba god of war and metallurgy, mm -hmm. okay? When you decide to take a story and expand on it or modernize it or whatever, mm -hmm. um, the fresh take is what, you want, is, is what you want to do. So the Knight in Shining Armor story, for example, there are many, 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 many stories of the Knight in Shining Armor across cultures, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with something that mythologizes our own past 
um, emphasizes our own culture and it elevates our own elevates our own um, position. That's my that's my take on it. You are right though. I do try to stay away from drawing a black Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get away. That's where there are no capes. I have no capes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I stay away from drawing a black a black um, a black uh, uh, Iron Man or things like that. I will I will um, I will try and stick to um, just making it as taking the indigenous um, depiction and bringing it forward. So for example, the Shango that I showed you earlier is modeled on actual figurines of Shango that I saw with the double-headed ax you know, on his head. And I just basically ex uh, uh, pull, that f pull that forward. And what's the know? feedback so far? What's the feedback? How, how are people receiving your work and your art form? It's interesting because when I exhibit, I get as many questions as, I get a lot more questions and criticisms and I get a lot of people who thought they knew and don't know. And keep in mind, and I need to emphasize this, I do not claim to be any kind of cultural expert whatsoever. I am not. I'm just an artist. I like to draw. Okay? When I exhibit, when I show Mother Africa and the Caribbeans, it's actually a big piece. Mm -hmm. When I show that piece, and I show King Leopold, they, they, I've got pictures of King Leopold. When I show... Um, the, I put the um, logos for the different um, Western businesses that benefited from the carving up of Africa. There are lots of folk who find it genuinely interesting. And I'm not doing it to create a sense of outreach. I'm just doing it to inform. I'm not doing it to create a sense of, of um, anger or to look for reparations or anything. Just so that you know and the, 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 uh, the overwhelming thing I get, the overwhelming reaction I get is questions. By far, the majority of reactions I get is questions. And I'm very quick to say things, what I know based on my research of the piece, and what I don't know in the hopes that the interest is enough for the person to go and do their own research. You know? And I think what I would love is for someone to see my stuff and to want to take it to another level. So like who, give us an example. Who do you think, who would you like to approach so, here's the example I'll give you. You know the movie Gladiator? Yeah, by, I, love by, yeah. I love yeah. that movie. Yeah. It was inspired, Ridley Scott saw a painting, which I actually have, mm -hmm. of a gladiator scene in Rome by a guy called Jean-Louis Genome. I believe that was his name. It was done in the 19th century. He saw mm -hmm. that picture and that inspired that movie Gladiator. I would love for one of my pieces or two of my pieces to inspire the same kind of reaction in someone else. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like. That's, 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 that would make me very happy. Where do people can find, where can people find your work and what you do? Are you on Instagram, on Facebook? Do you do I, workshops? I am on Instagram. I'm a 9J9JA. Nine, 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 you would have to uh, type this in the chat. If, or okay. or text, actually text it to me later on. I'll text it to you later on. 9JA yeah. underscore pop dot underscore art. I'm on Facebook as 9 pop art. And um, the, the, it's funny, Chief Tony, you're talking about my brother, he's my brother-in-law, mm -hmm. and he's always getting at me for, to do more than I do mm -hmm. to publicize it. I do as much as I can, but it's not my day job. You know, I have a job. I run a project. In fact, I will tell you, if you go on Etsy.com, you know, the, 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 the site that sells artwork, yeah. I'm on Etsy.com, and if you look for Ninja Pop Art, I'm there. Oh, well over 100 products on sale. Not all of them Africa related, because I do have a lot of other interests. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that there's not a lot of sleep involved with getting those things together, to, to, you know, creating that kind of portfolio. It, it, I basically will often come home from work on Friday and not sleep till Saturday, just working on pieces. Um, I would love to do more things like this, because I find it very interesting. And I hope I've done what you want in terms of illustrating my, um, my inspirations and my motivations. I would love to exhibit more you know kind of um around my my schedule uh -huh. you know that's what i would like so what would you say to a young person that wants to do something similar i would say to, I, I mentor young people and here's what i would say to a young person who wants to do anything anything at all 
and I have lived this. We've only talked about my artistic side. My engineering side, is a lot of depth there. I would say to a young person, you do not have the time you think you do. You do not have the time you think you do. So if you have something you want to do that does not harm anyone else and does not harm yourself, you need to do it. When I started this company, there were any number of reasons why I shouldn't have. I didn't have copyrights. I didn't have publishing. I had no source to make t-shirts. I didn't know where to get printed. I finally got tired of talking about it and thinking about it. I just did it. I just did it. The first book cover I ever did, I'd never done a book cover before. I had no training. I just did it. Mm -hmm. I just did it. You do not have the, my advice to any young person. And it doesn't matter whether it's art, medicine, law, or owning your own garbage disposal company. You do not have the time you think you do. If you want to do something, do it. Thank you very much, Roger. I think that was a fantastic interview. And I think many young people and parents and you know adults alike are going to be in awe because not many of us see something that they are not happy with and want to come back with a reality and a narrative that involves where they come from and their culture and their heritage. What are you doing about it? And I think, Roger, we have to give you a round of applause for the role that you're playing. And hopefully whoever watches this feels inspired enough to create a movie. <laughs> that would be uh, very, very flattering. I wouldn't even want, all I would want is just, we looked at one of Nigel Popart's works, Roger Okewale's works, and we liked it and we made this. If I got that, I would die happy. As far as the artistic side of me, I'd be good. Because it's, it's long overdue and I know the kind of good it would do. I know the kind of good it would do. I do. Thank you, Roger Okawole. Thank you very much.